I don't yet. I don't yet have uh, any plans for what we're going to talk about, but I'm kind of game to just see where this goes. Um, maybe continuing on our conversation from from voice and exit. Um, sure. You got anything? Uh, I'm. When I, I got anything, I mean, to start the conversation. <laughs> yeah. Is there anything in particular that you're like, oh, I've been wanting to talk about, blah blah blah. Well, so well, actually, maybe give me a. Um, let me sh sh shut off my phone and make sure it's not. I will have to hop off in about. I only have. I actually only have, unfortunately, because of our delay, about 20 minutes. Cool. So we'll make it. We'll make. Um, this is going to be. That makes it easier for other people to watch. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, so so what do you so tell me about tell me about how you like so why are you recording this? To, I you know we just met at Voice and Exit and I um I don't have a lot of that background on why you would want to record this this conversation. So tell sure. me about that. Sure. Sure. Uh, I don't publish very often, not for lack of desire, but I I speak more easily than I write. Um, my brain races so fast, but I'm such a perfectionist that when I start writing, I both want to go off on tangents and I want to make sure that that last sentence is perfect. And it ends up sort of paralyzing me. So I don't write a ton. Um, a number of people have been encouraging me to publish more. And I realized, oh, the way for me to publish is basically just to record some of the conversations that I have. And um, those can be, we can, I can record those and have those be essentially private unless we decide, cool, we can share them. Um, and I've been just doing interviews or conversations with really interesting people, and that's kind of the way for me at this point to just get ideas out into the world. So it's, that's, that's it. Sure. Um, yeah, that's kind of just You're it. You're incredibly delayed. Your picture and, and audio, for some reason, are so off that it's distracting. Sorry. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing. I don't know if that's because, me. Yeah. <laughs> I've got I don't my know band. If it's you're using, are you using your phone? Yeah, I am. Um, cause my cause my phone is probably better than my house. Uh, if you want, you can you can minimize the window. You can minimize the window <laughs> where you can see me, and that way it doesn't distract so much. All right, here we go. Yeah, there we go. Sure. Um, and I'll do the same. So, uh, I mean, I was interested in chatting with you about probably concepts around emergence um, and freedom and experimentation and systems, self-regulating systems, probably something along those lines. But I'm kind of sure. willing to, to let you steer. Um, well, um, that's a broad, that's a a bunch of broad stuff for us to talk about. I mean, let's, I, uh, let's, start with, let's do this. What is the most interesting thing? What's the thing that's like really capturing your attention at the moment, or that you are? And and this doesn't have to be like for mainstream consumption. Let's assume we're gonna sure. lose we're gonna lose the bulk of the general public on word three, <laughs> right? Let's go into <laughs> what we're in. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm sort of continuing to be interested in how to best communicate the idea of, of, of emergence and emergent order, which is you know, it's the name of our company, and that's because it's, my, it's our favorite. I think it's actually the single great contribution of the field of economics is, the, is a, an understanding that you can have um, the emergence of order without a designer that constructs the order sort of out of a single mind. Yeah, and I think when you understand that, when you truly um, uh, appreciate its implications, it changes the way you think about a lot of problems. Yeah, and I think it, it. On one hand, I feel like we're living in an era where we're surrounded by emergence in a much more visceral way than used to be the case. I mean, in a lot, in a certain sense, totally. there's a lot of invisible hands that are a lot more visible because of. Wikipedia and the internet itself and yeah. things well, like business Uber models, and Airbnb. Business models that are emerging, yeah, that are even stuff that's not sharing economy style rating systems, reputation stuff, even stuff that's just software development today 
is basically the whole lean startup movement is all about you don't know anything, so try small things, and the ones that work you can then double down on, right? But it's it's this it's this um, recognition that the solutions that actually work are going to emerge over time, and so you need to give yourself enough swipes at that. Um, in order to enable them to emerge, which means you have to make small bets rather than giant bets. Yeah. And I think, and, and I think it's also this. Um, so I, I just started reading *The Tyranny of Experts* by William Easterly. Okay. And uh, which is about um, it's about uh, economic development and the sort of meta debate. He, he, he's I'm only at the beginning of the book, but he's setting the stage for, I think, a debate about how best to essentially create growth in countries that have extreme poverty. Hmm. Sustainable growth. Because there's charity and then there's development. So charity is you give, you know, you give people money and, hope, and try to help them out. And then development, theoretically, is it some kind of systematic change that gives rise to self-sustaining yep. progress. Yep. And... You know, he frames it in terms of, uh, you know, he says that there's a debate that never happened, and in a way it's or ironic because the 1974 Nobel Prize in Economics was shared by um, Friedrich Hayek, who's mm -hmm. my all-time favorite, um, sort of of the greats, my favorite economist of the modern era is Russ Roberts, but and I and let me, I want to make sure I get his name right. Um, uh, 1974. No, I'm going to Google it because because the the other gentleman couldn't possibly have held a more diametrically opposed view of how the world works, mm -hmm. which made their shared prize bitter, <laughs> even weirder. I, I think I'm getting this right. I might be maybe I'm misremembering. Um, okay, and economics, economics. Uh, uh, okay, uh -oh. almost there, Google. Let's see. Yes, Gunnar Myrdal. Mm -hmm. Gunnar Myrdal. Mm -hmm. So um, Hayek's a bottom-up guy. Hayek believes in the, the importance of emergence and also the relevance of um, history. So, you know, if you believe in emergent systems, then you also sort of need to appreciate that at any given point in time, you are standing on the shoulders of giants in a certain sense. You're sort of, where you are now is the product of an emergent historical process that you don't yep. fully understand. Sure. And so it's, it, it, that pr produces a humility. You could even call it a conservatism, but I don't think, it, I don't think that's quite the right word for it, because conservative, I think, yep. says, you know, uh, preserve the present for the sake of the present, for the sake of tradition. So I think it's more a matter of humility. It's a matter of saying, if we want to change yeah. the world, yeah. we have to do our best to un understand what got us to where we are today. And yep. the other side of the spectrum, which is really, I mean, this Gunnar Myrdal, who I'm not that familiar with until starting to listen to this book, he's on the opposite side. And the opposite side has always dominated this field of, of um, development economics and foreign aid and top-down solutions. And basically, he's the central planner. He's the, I'm going to use my scientific knowledge that, and, and this techno, sort of techno-autocracy yep. mode to say, no, we can, we can wipe the slate clean, come in with all these design solutions. We know how to cure malaria. We just do X. We know how to cure hunger. We just do Y. And there's no, mm -hmm. and it doesn't matter whether you were in, um, you know, India in Uganda 1954 or Egypt, China, or, yeah, it, you know. Yeah. And so, and then, and then the, the sort of perverse part of that is, especially in the context of this, you you really ultimately are talking about autocracy, because. <laughs> You know, people aren't chess men that move, can be moved on a board, the way, like, like Adam Smith said. You can't just go in there and say, okay, um, for example, I guess there was, a, there was a, 
you know, Sweden's population was falling, and uh, Professor Myrdal wrote a paper explaining, well, what we need to do is obviously um, the problem with the reason why Swedes are having fewer kids is because they're spending more time per kid because they believe in this idea that you should raise your kids well and spend more time with them. And these are all um, antiquated superstitions. What we should do is have the state um, raise all children and dissolve the family as a unit because that's just some antiquated idea. <laughs> and so you get these sort of far-fetched, you can only implement them as some kind of totalitarian crazy person. And and, yeah, um, which was high. Which was high. I, I guess in a funny, about. funny way. Yeah. Yeah, and it, well, that was know, the road to with. serfdom. Uh, oh, I'm, I think I lost you. John, can you hear me? Yeah, you're back. Yeah, I, I, can I, drop, I dropped off twice. <laughs> All right. Um, so you, you you mentioned Road to Serfdom. As we're yeah, maybe we should just, should we just do audio only. Maybe that would yeah, be better. Yeah, that's what I just, just switched to. Um, yeah, okay, I just switched to audio. So yeah, yeah, that's ex that was exactly his point in Road to Serfdom, right? Like central, central power, centralized decision-making leads to... Socialism, totalitarianism, like it's all—it all goes. If you're going to eventually achieve those goals, you're going to achieve it through that, that, that structure, which is. And I think the, the sort of the the cartoon version is that um, if you start down that path in any sense, you immediately are on the slippery slope. Mm -hmm. And that is that was not the point he was making, and he doesn't frame it that way in the book. I think yeah. most of his critics have never actually read the book. Um, but uh, in fact, it's it's always sort of shocking to me to see that some of the criticisms from people who, you know, sometimes have Nobel prizes about Hayek. It's like, did you read him? Did you read any of it? <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. basically, he his his argument is, look, 
there's a whole set of reasons that give rise to this challenge of trying to plan society from the top down. And, and there's systematic reasons why it'll fail. But if you continually endeavor to try in the face of these failures, if you say, okay, here's the rules I'm going to lay out for you and people don't comply, it, it, the, the sort of only path to stay on your plan is to compel people. Yeah. And, and, and so he walks through that scenario of, look, go any further, and the next set of steps you have to take are pretty pretty gruesome. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, and then, like, and then what kind of people... And then, you know, he also has you know, some other commentary. Well, like, well, what kind of people want to do that? Want, want to lord over others and believe that they yeah. know better than others? Yeah. You know, that's not a very savory character that wants to do that. So it's, yeah. a, it's a pretty... But I, I mean, I think in a way, the bigger, the broader thing that, I, that always gets me really excited and interested is just the sort of... The challenge of explaining, exploring this idea of emergence um, in a social context, given how we tend to sort of understand it in other domains, mm. and and actually like you know broad, you know pretty broad ranges of people will criticize central planning, uh, you know. It, in other places, like the, the most sort of noteworthy one in a way is, I think you'll very often find that the, that people who are the most ag aggressively antagonistic towards people who believe in creationism, yeah, will probably believe in will tend perhaps I'm making the generalization, but will tend to be sort of economic creationists. <laughs> Sure. No, sure. all of human complexity didn't come about because of some creator. It just evolved spontaneously through a kind of genetic co competitive process. It's like, yes, that's correct, like society. It's like, no, 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 wait, no, no, no. No, society, we have to have overlords to tell us what to do because <laughs> then we, you know, we won't, we don't. <laughs> it's like, oh, so the, yeah. the gene can be selfish. But the yeah. person that is composed of these selfish genes, no, they can't be trusted. And <laughs> yeah, so. and and for me, for me, that's basically a result of um, living within a system and that is so ever present that you're almost not even aware that you are within that specific system. Um, and we live within a system of of violence, right? We live a, we live within a system that the bulk of our education in terms of focusing on governance is focused on governance through violence, right? It's focused on monopoly of violence with, with, via the state and all of that jazz, and it doesn't focus on the other structure which was always present in every society from the beginning, um, that the other coercive mechanism, the other mechanism that helped you to compel others to behave the way you wanted them to behave, and that was not violence, it was the threat of being cut off. It was the threat of losing status, the threat of potentially ostracism, um, and... Right, shame, shame. guilt, yeah. Reputation. Well, and, 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 and just reputation, just status. And, and it was funny for me, like I literally had like this slap your forehead wake up moment, right? Like. I had been studying political theory for a long time. I'd been interested in this. I was looking for a better structure for global institutions, basically. I was trying to figure out a better global um, international economic and political order and was not finding something that worked, right? I couldn't get around the whole tyranny of the majority issue. And um, studying ancient China 2,000 years ago, I suddenly realized, holy crap, you know, we used reputation. Like, that was how... Every society regulated themselves, um, not just China, but every community. It's, how, it's the bulk of how regulation happens within our communities today. Um, it's something that enables disagreement about what is appropriate and yet is still very effective at keeping people behaving well. And so it has both the flexibility to enable us to disagree and to behave in, in ways that don't align um, and the effectiveness 
because when people do behave in ways that we don't like, we can sort of go, well, I'm not going to interact with you anymore. Um, and I think that most people just aren't aware of that whole regulatory system. That, that regulatory system is something that the bulk of humans don't think about. Um, and eBay and rating systems that are do doing regulation like that, they are starting to kind of make that more, I don't know, in your face in the world, right? People, people can see it better now. But, yeah, I just um, used Angie's list to get an air conditioning guy to come out and um, yeah. we had an air problem with our air conditioner. And uh, you know, you have all kinds of information asymmetries, as, as economists like to talk about. Yeah. There's all these, all you know, um, there's all these ways. I feel like you, the best way for you to be an economist is to find a straw man version of the perfect world that you can then point out why that straw man's wrong. <laughs> so, oh, in the perfect world, there's perfect competition, and there's an unlimited number of suppliers competing there's perfect for an unlimited information. number of, Yeah, perfect information, and everybody knows everything. And, uh, and so if there's any deviation from that, well, then we, you know, then we, we've got something we can talk about. We've got some kind of yeah. public policy that can step in. And, uh, and uh, it, it's such a bizarre sort of... It, and it really is a sort of straw man. It's like, it, it's, look, we have, um, we never have perfect information. Nobody does. Yeah. In fact, if, if, consider if we, for a moment how, what would that would imply if we actually, if everyone could know everything. I mean, it wouldn't yeah. grind all, all creativity to a halt. That's right. <laughs> Which was a big <laughs> chunk of that I had I gave, right? Like, that was a big chunk of what I was yeah. talking about in my speech was around you know, the role and value of privacy as a facilitator of communication and exploration. And I, I thought that that's a incredibly potent idea that you, that, you know, you put at the center of your talk that um, I don't think many people take into account. They focus on the creepiness factor of being spied on or, that's right. or, 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 or the notion that, well, why would you... You know, on one hand, you've got, oh, it's creepy. On the other hand, it's like, well, what do you have to hide? It's like, well, yeah. I saw this plot of land, and I have this vision for what I'm going to do with it. And if I told the landowner my intentions of what I'd like to do with it, they would actually hold out for a price that would actually arbitrage away my ability to even to do it. That's so, right, because they would they would be they would know what the oh. upper limit of my my negotiating, um, where I was willing to go to. Yeah, like, yeah. and and so it's like I I feel like a lot of um, I think maybe it was Thomas Sal that said, uh, you know, great economics is is about saying is about asking the question and then what. Yeah, you know, so it, it's it's one thing to be to to notice some static state, and 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 then sort of do your sort of analysis around some frozen moment in time, or to focus on the distribution of X, Y, and Z, whether it's income or land or you name it. It's another thing to let you know take your finger off of the stopwatch and let that clock start moving and see what happens over time. Yeah, and. It just changes the game. It changes your entire ability to sort of think about and what you should be thinking about and what you should be paying attention to. And like, you know, let's play the game a couple times. Okay, so yes, I get screwed over by you because you're the, you're you're a bad dealer. Well, do I deal with you again? Yeah. So if I don't deal with you again, or if I, you know, like I said, have, if I have various ways of sharing my experience with other people, then you have an incentive to be a, uh, to be a fair dealer and you know you can do the same yeah, for me as a customer. There's a lot of, there's just so many more systems that can support and facilitate, you know, repeat dealings with one another. There's a, a couple of things, a couple of uh, things to check out if you haven't seen them. One, uh, Bruce Schneier's book, Liars and Outliers. Um, I'll have to check that out. 
really good. Bruce Schneier is one of the top security. Um, a he's a he's a top notch security uh, programmer, basically um, systems designer, but he's also a top security consultant and uh, and author on issues related to security. And Liars and Outliers is pretty darn phenomenal in terms of mapping out. Like my my biggest beef with it was. Ding! He said so eloquently the stuff that I've been wanting to say for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> um, but he he mapped out the whole. Um, you will always have defectors, people who are trying to you know pull one over on the existing system, and you will have cooperators, and you want that. You don't want to get to a world where there is no defection, because if you get to a world where there's no defection. We stop getting good at defending ourselves, and so we become vulnerable to other threats, right? And so it's this very, um, you know, ecosystem approach to thinking about security. Um, and yeah, kind of like biodiversity out. versus monoculture, yeah. robustness versus fragility. I'm a big fan of uh, Nassim Taleb as well. Yeah, and he he's very interested in, uh, you know, how do you make how do you make um, create environments that are robust that aren't prone to you know that aren't prone to break or if they break they 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 don't um, they break they break fast it's like the fail fast it's the same thing in startups in a lot of ways you can see how the, the entire ethos of failing fast I, I don't think it's um, unrelated that no no it's fully that's that was the point I made earlier with the lean startup stuff right it's it's it is just a recognition of these principles applied to business. And, and really, in my mind, where it comes from is, you know, with the rise of the Internet, you have an increasing pace of innovation because somebody comes up with an idea that gets shared globally more quickly, and so suddenly other people are able to build upon that idea in a day rather than waiting for three years for that information to have gotten into a publication that finally made it out to them. You know what I mean? And so people are building, being able to build upon one another's work faster, which means the pace of, of innovation is accelerating, which means the landscape is changing shape more rapidly. So you are no longer operating on sta in, in a fairly static context. Well, if we are suddenly operating in a much more dynamic and rapidly changing context, the ability to execute upon what you know well already and what you've established over a very long period of time about what works in your existing context, that's not going to serve as such a great predictor going forward because the context is changing. So the, the patterns, the work structures that end up being better are the ones that are constantly sensing the environment, sensing opportunities, sensing threats, sensing shifts. Um, and so a, a lot of the consulting work that I end up doing is focused around that, around in a more rapidly changing environment. What are the ways of organizing an, a company? And what are the cultural uh, behaviors that you want to encourage within an organization in order to be able to uh, adapt quickly, to be able to learn rapidly, and to be able to build upon one another's uh, learnings within that organization? I think... Um one of the other things that I don't, I don't feel like this, it's hard to know sort of the cause and effect, but I think it's interesting that the tech industry um, you know, became obsessed with a fail fast, um, you know, m minimize the cost of your entrance into, 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 an, into a market or, you know, with your product model. And it happened to be an industry that went through a big boom and bust and did not get any bailouts. Mm -hmm. So you had, you know, I, I actually, I was working in TV animation at the time of the dot-com bubble crash. And actually lost my job along with the, the elimination of the, the MTV <laughs> animation department. But, um, but nobody stepped in and bailed out pets.com or no. any, any of those firms. Yeah. Or, or, or the... Or the investors that, that lent, lent them, that uh, you know, bought bought their stock or lent them money. There was no, you didn't hear any uh, so-called economists screaming about systemic risk and cascade effects, and and yet, and so what do you know? You know, a decade later, 
the most robust, most thriving. The, you know, we can argue, well, we're, we're just in the middle of another tech bubble. I don't know what the, I don't, it's impossible to know whether that's true or not. But sure. you certainly have seen this massive acceleration of um, innovation and this cultural shift to, um, to the to the sort of lean startup and and uh, you know model. And, and well, I think my... you, you just compare that. You can just sort of just real quick. You compare that to the financial crisis of two thousand eight, where what we had was okay. In the aftermath of that, we have a set of well, a most of the most of the banks get bailed out, and even the ones that are allowed to go bust. The the credit the creditors of those banks, Bear Stearns and Brothers, they got all made, they all get made whole. They yeah. Maybe Lehman may be the one exception, but for the most part, all the lenders go get off without a hitch. Mm -hmm. And then and then we get a so-called reform that literal that actually codifies to the, the the very thing that was the problem. It basically says now we need to actually in advance. Identify so-called systemically important companies, yeah. which which more or less says, "Hey, here's an awesome emblem that if you if you earn, you're protected, <laughs> and you get to." Be, and so we've actually seen the you know that the financial system get more static instead of more dynamic and more bloated and big instead of leaner and smarter. Mm. So it's just a sort of you see sort of two different. Systematic approaches playing out, and um, I just wish more people would take would learn uh, you know the lessons that I think that are there in front of your face to learn about that. It's interesting. I you know I'm I'm not super well informed on Bitcoin. I studied a little bit, and but I haven't been playing with Bitcoin myself. But I, I'm interested to see what happens with to finance as as some of those alternate alternate systems start to really mature. But what I will say is my uh, theory, and this is part of what I've, this is another piece that I go into with the consulting work, is that the reason that Silicon Valley adopted the lean startup stuff first, I mean, A, Steve Blank, who kind of outlined that stuff, like, you know, he's here, but, and he came out of that world. But the, <laughs> basically, Silicon Valley, their industries were initially software, and um, software was the first industry to get disrupted by the internet. Right? How was software delivered prior to the internet? Yeah. Physically. <laughs> yeah, a disc, right? I went to stores and bought boxes that had discs in them or a cartridge in them, and or a floppy, right? And I put that thing into my computer. They, just like everybody else, had development cycles based on shipping physical products. And that meant that they were developing for a year or two years, and then they would launch that product. And so they could launch a new iteration once every year, let's say. Once you're able to ship bytes instead, instead of having to sh ship disks, you can launch, you can ship that product every day. You can ship it 400 times a day. I know there's uh, some of the online gaming companies, when they went through that transition, it was a big revolution, right? Because your whole decision-making process, which was, wow, we got to have somebody high up approve all these things that are going to go in, because if it goes bad, it goes real bad, right? We can't screw anything up. Um, there's lots of testing, lots of everything going on before a customer ever sees it, before you're ever able to get feedback about whether or not people like this or don't like it. When you transition to a model where you're constantly able to make adjustments, you can ship 400 code updates a day. You can be shipping them in parallel, so you're doing A, B testing or A through Z testing. Um, the, how high up on the totem pole you want decision making to happen, that transitions. Because A, the, the ease of getting feedback has changed, the cost of getting feedback has changed, and the timing for getting feedback has changed. All of that's able to happen instantly rather than over long months or year long cycles. And um, what that did was that put pressure on the, on the companies within 
the software industry and then related industries um, to push power down, basically, to enable people lower on the totem pole to do to test stuff and to ship code. Um, and so that is what has pushed, in my mind, the fact that the software companies got disrupted by the internet first is what pushed them to start experimenting with new organizational structures and new business models. And everybody else, the internet is now maturing to a place where, whether it's through CAD or CNC or 3D printing or social uh, marketing systems, every other business on the planet is starting to get disrupted by the economics of digital in the same way. They're not going to necessarily go to the same place. They're not going to necessarily go to, I can ship things for free, <laughs> right? Yeah, right. Um, but, but they're going to move down that path, right? They're going to move towards um, places where they are able to gain an advantage. They're able to gain an evolutionary advantage in their new context by having decision making be more distributed than it was before. And you're still gonna have, even in, even in the dot coms of today, you still have centralization of decision making. You still have experts within the company who are great at doing this or great at doing that and everybody turns to them or they maybe have authority, right? They have final approval before something ships. Um, so it's not that you go to a completely flat structure, but you're seeing these flattening structures and I think they are a direct result of, of the economics of digital. I think you're exactly right, and I think that the um, it's really interesting to to think about how to organize a firm. I mean, we our company we're eight people, and we're a creative agency, so hmm. it's uh, in a certain sense. Um, I, I I would love nothing more, especially given our name, than to than to, 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 to even more fully embrace an emergent type of process internally. But there is a, there does seem to be a challenge in in the in the nature it's like the nature of the projects the nature of the kinds of processes and I think the size I mean one of the things that's powerful about software is um, how each individual person really is a kind of independent creator at the same time that they're a contributor and, yeah. you know, whether it's object oriented programming or, or or just the nature of writing code, you know, and then you've got these, this entire amazing superstructure, GitHub, and these, and these systems to, to be able to version track and essentially yeah. be a sort of distributed. Um, it, it's, it's been it has it has been built for distributed workflow, um, and I think. Not every process has yet. It's like it's not clear to me. In fact, we'll have to have another conversation about <laughs> how how you know maybe I um I'm probably not making use of perhaps some techniques that could that could even be more empowering to folks. So it's sort of a, it's a challenge. Like at what size can you start to implement more like a more emergent management approach? Yeah. Or, you know, at, at what point are you able to sort of push decision making power out to the edges? I mean, you know, is it twenty people? I guess does, is it is it fifteen? Is it a hundred? Um, you know, they say you can only ever have. It's probably best to make, keep keep only seven direct reports. Like, does that still is that still true? Um, <laughs> yeah. I, I, I think to some extent it is. I mean, I think uh, you know, the, the tools that I'm trying to build on the application side are focused on enabling people to um, synthesize information and share those syntheses while also giving others the ability to dive into the details. I think there is a limit in terms of what humans can process at any one point in time. Um, Hayek had talked at one point about, you know, as human civilization advances and uh, becomes more complex, the total, the, the percentage of the total that each of us is able to understand decreases, right? right. So we, we, actually, we actually become less well informed of, you know, all of everything, basically. Yeah, um, you, as, you as go we, from, yeah, you go from a world where Leonardo, where, you know, Leonardo da Vinci is a, is this, is a polymath of the most, um, 
it, it, literally knows shame. everything. He had, like literally know he's within his <laughs> mind he's got a double digit percentage of the latest in all of human knowledge and now yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know we've got seven billion people on the planet and there's no way. Yeah. You know, no one person really even knows how to make a pencil to sort of lead well, and the, and the, the heritage other, of, 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 of classical liberal thinkers. <laughs> the other piece that Hayek is so brilliant for, in my mind, is um, putting different forms of knowledge on, on even footing, right? So you have, like, scientific knowledge, technical knowledge, but then you have knowledge of circumstances. Like, where is the meat cheap, Right. Right. And, and recognizing that those other forms of knowledge have value um, and are important uh, really changes how you think about uh, a community and, and, and that community sort of optimizing for uh, you know, what, what, what mechanisms are going to enable that community to get sort of best results. And you yeah, know, his, his exactly. paper... Um, that's a great point because his like his paper, the use of knowledge in society, which yeah. was written in the forties or fifties. Yeah, it was in the forties, um, like forty-three, uh, I think. Yeah, like he, you know, where he basically used the example of um, the price of tin, and yeah. that I mean, this is the argument. In fact, and since I've only got about three more minutes before I have to hop onto a call that I'm yeah <laughs> unprepared for. <laughs> um, speaking of speaking of lack of knowledge. Um, the uh, you know, it, 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 he saw it, he saw the market mechanism, the, the prices, prices that emerge out of a bidding yeah. process. Yeah. Um, and as, that and that we don't have to know all the details. The, right. The, we don't need to know market. that tin. You know, if, if I'm using tin in my production process, let's say I'm making, uh, I don't know, let's let's, let's say aluminum to, to pull it into the future a little bit. Or I'm using aluminum for my for my computers. And I'm able to sell my computers at for a thousand dollars, and the price of aluminum starts going up. I don't need to know why. The fact that the price starts going up starts to set in motion a set of incentives that um, that are good. So, and good from a optimization of everyone involved standpoint. So let's imagine that the reason why the price of aluminum is going up is because. There's millions of people being lifted out of poverty in China, hundreds of millions, and they're buying cars now. Yeah. And these are people who cars are revolutionizing their lives. They're saving their kids. They're helping them get into the modern, into a modern, long-lived, comfortable, productive life. I don't even know that. Price of aluminum is going up. I switch production of my <laughs> laptop from aluminum. <laughs> To yeah. titanium, or to or to sure. copper, or to or to sure. polycarbonate, and yeah. so I or wood. <laughs> so there's this amazing, you could say, sort of re, you know, natural redistributive impact of yeah. having market prices, and then the secondary thing that's even more important is the guys making aluminum start making a lot of money. It attracts people into the production of aluminum. <laughs> so yep. you end up with, you. not only do you have distributional changes, which I think tends to be the concern of folks who are, who are, who are critical of markets. Oh, they produce inequality, and they yep. see this distributional outcome. But because of the price signal, because of that the increasing price brings profit opportunity, you know, it actually it, it encourages more production. So, so it, yeah. it isn't even the case that we've had it. hundreds of millions of people being lifted out of poverty over the past 30 years, and yet we're eating more. We're buying more stuff because because the price system for all so the I will things say, that are in the way, you know, we actually are we, we get more of everything. And I <laughs> that you have to jump on a call right now, but I'm going to make one last point. The stuff that I'm working on, I'm trying to extend what Hayek had pointed out about the role of price in society as a cheap signaling function and recognize that the problem with price as the only cheap signaling function is that it doesn't convey why, right? And so when we look at things, we are not able to, to figure out whether or not the behaviors that were involved in creating that aluminum 
um, are behaviors that we actually want to support, whether that's slavery or the pollution of rivers or whatever else. And what I'm trying to do is to create information systems that enable additional signaling to happen cheaply as well. Um, yeah, so that's, that, that's yeah. a powerful. Um, that is a. It's a powerful opportunity that I feel like you know you're right. You're right to recognize is finally. Finally, seems technically feasible. To, to that's exactly it, right? It's, it's, and, and, and the goal there is for us not necessarily to agree about the value of a specific behavior, right? But if I find myself in a position where I do have access to that information about how you produced the aluminum, and I also have access to information, let's say some algorithm that I'd written for saying whether or not that was good or bad or relatively good or bad compared to other other ways, other people's behaviors, that allows me, if that can get distilled down, that can allow me to make an informed decision that, that fits with my values. So we can disagree about what's appropriate, but we can still self-organize. And so that's what I'm trying to build. And I think in a way, what you're ultimately doing, when, to the extent you can succeed in that and that others can, you're increasing the likelihood that the transactions that take place that are you know freely freely made before the fact, you feel good about after the fact. That that's right. Ex ante and ex post align align with each other more frequently. Yeah. I mean, and I believe that if you if you do that, you end up having the regulation of the system built into the system rather than having to layer external regulation on top of it, government regulation, etc. So that's that's kind of the grand goal. Yeah. Well, I am. Um, I'm going to have to hop off now, Matt, but this is awesome. a, let, let, on ep episode two, we'll dive into the, dive into the weeds even more. <laughs> that sounds great. Thanks, John. Talk to you soon. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.